Every year, a unique group of pilots celebrate humankind's most primitive form of flight. And the spectacle it creates makes quite the statement. Boasting hundreds of balloons, some larger than the Statue of Liberty, all launching at once and nearly one million attendees, the Albuquerque International Balloon Festival is a world in itself. This is Mecca for hot air balloons. The normal is the extreme here. It's God's country for balloonists. We even took to the skies on board the most popular balloon on site, where we had our most high octane experience yet. I get over, David. I may dive bomb in here, all right? Dive bomb. Dive? Dive bomb? Okay, so obviously we're in the most visually interesting place in the world, objectively, there's no disputing that. Let us know in the comments which balloon you think is your favorite, and be sure to subscribe to our channel, Off the Cuff. Like it too, like it. Yeah. Our journey began at the comforting time of 4 a.m. Somehow there's already like thousands of people here. We immediately signed our lives away and headed to the mandatory pilot's briefing where we are introduced to our personal pilot, Doug, who happens to fly the most popular balloon at the festival. This is where crews are told of the day's weather, any obstructions, and general information about the event. Above all, the crowd awaits the biggest piece of information, whether or not they are allowed to fly. Thank you, Sam. You're gonna wanna catch that as it flies away. One determining factor are the area's variable winds, which are indicated by a weather balloon. Launch strike, here we go. Just climbing, there's no wind to move it. 500 pilots or anyway, is that a good thing? No. It's a good possibility we won't launch just from a safety standpoint. If you launch 600 balloons off this field, what are they going to do? It's going to go up, and that's dangerous. Then comes the daunting test flight, Dawn Patrol. Balloons can only fly via far visual flight boards, so we can only fly between sunrise and sunset. In Dawn Patrol, you're literally launching before sunrise. Just like you see airplanes with a steady and a blinker, we have a, a, a string of lights that hang down from the basket. Dawn Patrol is one of my favorite flights here. None of this would be possible without Tom, the event's media relations director. This is the largest balloon event in the world. You know, we actually had the opportunity to set a world record uh, with 543 balloons uh, in 2019. Why is the balloon community so developed in this part of the world? You know, it's because of the Sandia Mountains and the Rio Grande. We have amazing flying conditions, you know, more than 300 days out of the year. So is there a point where the pilots are just going to be more advanced where they can manage the smaller amount of landing spaces, or is it just going to be what it is and maybe you land on someone's lawn and get scolded? Yeah, when the first pilots were landing uh, in France, uh, you actually had the pilots who were armed with bottles of champagne. So when they landed in somebody's field, the farmer's angry, but the pilot has a bottle of champagne to present, say, my apologies for your trouble. Please accept this bottle of champagne on my behalf. And that's actually how champagne came into uh, the whole ballooning culture. This ballooning culture has been around for much longer than people think. The first flight actually took place in 1783, 120 years before these guys. In front of 40,000 citizens and the royalty of Versailles, the Montgolfier brothers floated a duck, a rooster, and a lamb in a smoke-filled envelope. A few months later, the first human passengers took to the sky. Following this, pilots attempted record-breaking flights across the Atlantic, used balloons as reconnaissance in the Civil War, and ballooning competitions started to materialize. But then the sport lay dormant for almost a century, till 1960 when balloons started to show up again, particularly in New Mexico, which melded a bit of its own culture with ballooning. Breakfast Burrito is a community in and of itself, because it's the ultimate grab-and-go kind of meal, which is perfect for ballooning. Uh, you know, in the cold mornings, you'll actually see some of the balloonists come out of the pilot area with a burrito in each hand, and they just call them hand warmers. And they put them in their pocket, and they warm up their hands. And when their hands are warm enough, they'll eat the burritos. <laughs> so, of course, we partook in the burrito festivities. But before we got to that, the green light was given, and Doug's pig team started the grueling process of preparing the balloon. Dozens of piglets swarmed around in a hurry. And I personally felt like an obstacle. Out there! There! I'm not called 
doesn't anymore. Inflation started and the field transformed. Our pig found its wings and we quickly loaded into the basket. Let us work real simply on the principle that hot air rises and cool air descends. So we put heat in a balloon to get lift, which takes us up, and we either cool on our own or we pull this red line right here, which will pull that top out. And that'll let heat out quicker and we can descend faster, okay? This is like the most high octane event I've been to in my entire life. There's, I've never seen more people crammed into one space gawking at the same time. It's insane. Keeping the entire event moving is a team known as the Zebras. They've managed to simplify their multitude of tasks into three crucial words. How did you get into zebraing? So my mom is actually a lunch director as well. Okay, so, so it's in the family. It's in the family, I'm second generation. This is my 14th year in Stripes. So you're a veteran? Uh, yeah, I've been here a long time. <laughs> and what are you looking out for? I mean, a lot of dangerous things could go Absolutely. wrong. So we want to make sure that spacing is right so they don't go right up into another one because the pilots that are going up can't see what's above them. So it's our jobs to see what's above them so they can take off safely. This is the one of the only events where you can actually go up to the balloons. So I think that also gets people excited because they're kind of immersed in it. How many zebras is it broken up between? There are 55 of us this year. While they are officially the referees of the field, many dress like real zebras in an effort to keep their spirits fun and stand out in the crowd. Before each flight, a zebra has to approve the takeoff. I've been waiting all my life for a woman like you. <laughs> Rachel parted the seas and our journey commenced. We're moving all right. We're go? moving. That is wild! I felt like I was in the way that entire time getting up in the air. With most forms of flight, say airplanes and helicopters, pilots are typically able to plan a landing zone ahead of takeoff. However, balloons, being at the mercy of the elements, are in need of a little help. For us, it was a chase crew, or pig two. Okay, we're leaving. Their job was to track our flight and meet us, wherever we may land, which at this point was entirely unknown. Phil joined Pig 2 for the day. We can see them taking off right now. There goes our pig. We're gonna chase them down now. Right now you're about 75 feet above the ground, which is about right. Holy cow. That's what I'm saying, what a view, huh? Is that a view and a half? That's quite the view. We got Yoda back there, climbing up. And Darth Vader. Oh my goodness. airborne heater and that's our that's our propulsion we use the heat to get up like we're going up right now to try and get a right to head that way if we can yeah what's up it's my first time doing this but i think we're chasing the piggy we were gonna, when he lands we have to pull him down and fold him up and chasing the piggy chasing, chasing the, the piggy. pig <laughs> have you ever done this before First time. Uh, first time too? First time. Glad to be chasing the bear. So how long do you think it's going to take for them to touch land? She said like an hour and a half yeah. worth of propane. Hour and a oh, half? Okay, hour and a half. I didn't know that actually. While the chase crew navigated the roadways, Doug navigated the airstreams, which is entirely dependent on the day's weather patterns. To learn more about why Albuquerque makes this the ideal location in the United States for flying, we spoke with Brad, one of the members of the event's meteorology team. What are, 
the most extreme uh, conditions that you could fly in. So typically, yeah, yep. So on the surface, we'd like to fly in winds less than 10 miles an hour, but above that, we can fly in faster winds. You may have noticed the gas balloons that took off here last night. Their goal is to get geographically as far away from here as possible, so they want fast winds. Unfortunately, we're dealing with a situation for them that there's relatively slow winds, so they're just kind of hanging around. In fact. Uh, so the over, they took off feet, 12 plus hours ago, and they've only traveled there, about 70 miles. They went, they went over the mountains, so they're just east of the mountains here. Um, and, and now they're working their way across eastern New Mexico and western portions of Texas this morning. Okay, we're all going to look for power lines. There's two things about power lines. They're everywhere you think they are, along roads and intersections but then they're everywhere you think they aren't. And that's the thing that we have to be concerned with and be careful about. Power lines, definitely something to be concerned about. Just months before our flight, five balloonists were killed merely miles away from our launch spot after they collided with a high voltage line. They fell around 150 feet and died from blunt force trauma. New Mexico's governor is offering her condolences tonight after a horrific hot air balloon crash killed everyone on board. I think people would be fascinated to know, like, you're a pilot. Like, you need to have a pilot's license. Well, that's the thing that amazed me. Hot air balloons are actually registered aircraft for the FAA. You def you have to have a pilot certificate to fly them. For you, what's the best part of all this? To me, there's something there's something magical and mystical about the fact that you can take you can take a sack of hot air and fill it full of cold air and then heat it up and fly and leave the ground. To me, that's just, I mean, think about that. We just took a sack of hot air and off we go. You know, to me, it's awesome to be able to do that. The it's mountains, the sunrise, the shadows, the color in the skies, it's all, it's all gorgeous. I mean, that's the other thing about ballooning. It's just an absolutely beautiful aviation activity. This is such a strange feeling. I think we were both a little afraid of the heights thing. Like, I don't do too yeah. great with heights, but it... I'm okay because it's calm. Yeah, it's not rocky. We're not, we're not swaying. We're just going with the wind. While in the air, it was hard to ignore the fact that we were trusting a massive piece of cloth to keep us up. So while on the ground, we sought out what hot air balloons are actually made of. So hot air balloons are made usually of lightweight synthetic fabric, so nylon is a great material. Um, and it's the kind of material to, to visualize it, you know, if you, if you go camping and have a tent, it's that kind of weight and feel of material. And so it looks like a generic fabric, but it really is a highly technical fabric. And putting together a balloon is a lot like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. You start out with hundreds and hundreds of pieces, and they all have to go in the right sequence, in the right place, the right way around, the right way up. Everything has to be built just perfectly. After our relaxing journey, it was time for Doug to bring us back to land before we ran into the airport. I get over, David. I made dive bomb in here, all right? Dive bomb. Bend your knees. Yeah, Bend your knees. Hold on to an upright. Get ready to jump on me, all right? Do not get in front of me. Bend our knees. Hold on to an upright with two hands, which you didn't do. Failed landing 101. I'm a smacky one. Jeez, <laughs> we're here. Wow. Our, where's our chase vehicle? We found her. Looks like we found him. We found him. Still inflated in the parking lot. Search and rescue. There's our our storm crew. Hey. After the crew was back together, the next step was to disassemble the massive balloon. And for the first time, I felt at least a little bit useful.
big balloon. That's a big balloon. Mm -hmm. These little racer balloons. Five, six hundred pounds, somewhere in there. To figure out what it's like crewing this 600 pound balloon, we talked with Rick, the head of the Hamlet Pig Balloon Crew. It's obvious when a balloon's in the air, everyone's looking at it, you can see how beautiful it is. If right. the chase crew wasn't doing what you guys do, the balloons would never fly again. You can ask any balloonist out there and they will tell you that their, the flight is only as good as their chase crew. And it's a lot like flying fixed wing airplanes. Uh, the fixed wing pilots will tell you it's only as good as their mechanics. The airlines will tell you they're only as good as their, their flight attendants and the reservationists and their baggage handlers. I mean, I, I hate to use the term it takes a village, but it almost takes more than a village because you have to have people that don't necessarily know aviation coming in and, and, and taking part of it. Great first flight this morning. Thank you all very much for all your hard work and everything you did. The next day, the rest of our crew, William and Philip, took a flight of their own. While they were in the air, we were drawn to the charisma of this man, named Daniel. So are you part of the When Pigs Fly crew now? I am. I am. Okay. Uh, I've known Doug for a long time. Um, and I have actually flown the balloon. So wow. I'm, one, I'm one of the pilots. Tell us about the balloon. I mean, obviously people like it. You've got an insane swarm of people that come specifically for the pig. Well, for every child who was told that they can get a new bicycle when pigs fly, we have the answer. <laughs> I take people who have a sense of adventure, and even the terrified ones have a sense of adventure, but once they get up, the anxiety loosens up, and then they can look out and they see all of creation in a way that very few people can see it. You can't see it like this in a helicopter, it's too noisy. You can't see it in an airplane because it's going too fast. When you're floating above the earth and you look down and you see the patchwork of farmlands and houses, when you do a dawn patrol and you see all the lights shining in the darkness, it's just magical. On a number of levels, you stand still and the earth falls away beneath you. And when you look out, it's like, oh, awesome. No one ever ascends into the skies to view the earth the way we view it and does not come back changed. There's a weather phenomena in Albuquerque called the box. Okay? And what happens is, is that first thing in the morning you get a low level drainage from north to south which takes balloons to the south. Up above there is a high level wind when the box sets up which is traveling from south to north. So you can go south, you climb, you go north. If the box is really strong, you drop back down to the south, come over, up. There are days when people have launched from the field and landed on the field having passed the field three or four times. Wow. That's what makes Albuquerque unique. And that's what brings people from all over the world to right where we're standing. All over the world. Many here fly for leisure. However, a select few come to compete and in an even higher octane event that happens later in the day. Prior to competition, we met with Lieutenant Colonel Will Fitzpatrick, who pilots the Civil Air Patrol balloon. So the targets are gonna be on the field itself. So you're gonna watch like 75 competitors all slam into a small, tiny cookie cutter right outside that mile ring. And then we're gonna to try to all get in here. You, you can predict where you're going to land um, depending on the winds aloft and how that works in the long run, everybody's now picking different places on whatever their strategy is to get here and get to a, a target that's like 10 meters across and throw a baggie on it. So are you guys all up in the air at the same time, like fighting for the best spot yep. to drop your payload? Yep. Wow. There's an X and what you want to do is you want to get your baggie closest to the X on either one of the islands or on the boat itself. Whoever stacks up the points at the end of competition is going to be the overall winner. How high are you dropping these sandbags from? Oh, the lower you are, the closer you are, that you can basically pretty much drop straight on it, the better off you're going to do. I like to be about six inches off the ground when I drop, if I can. As really? long as you don't touch. As long as I don't touch. Okay, so you're coming right in through the mess. Yes. And just like that, competitors went off to choose their launch points while the staff arranged the target field. Soon enough, the air was filled with competition. He's going for the boat. Wow, 
think he's going to win. By being the balloon that hits the right uh, elevation and the right altitude, can be able to figure out how to get into the field at the lowest level possible. Then they have a better chance of hitting the target. The staff ended the competition due to a dramatic increase in wind speed and measured the closest beanbag. But because the balloons were already in the air, they were forced to crash land on the field. Fortunately, there were many members of the ballooning community there to catch them. Oh, oh. At the end of the day, it only made sense that Harris and I celebrated our successful flights with some of Albuquerque's finest ballooning champagne. I'm gonna go home, and I'm gonna tell my family about that time that I crapped my pants in a hot air balloon. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go home, tell my family about that time I crapped my pants after eating a breakfast burrito. <laughs> and that's our New Mexico experience. <laughs>